Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Film Seizure. I am Jeff Arbuckle. I am King Arthur. Huh. Do you have the sword of power? Do you have the charm of making? Um, yeah, I do, actually. <laughs> I do. I have it right here. Uh, but, but I'm not going to... Yeah, I'm not gonna let you use it to go with with your squirreliness. I'm gonna like make, use it to turn into whatever Helen Mirren wants me to look like. <laughs> That's what I'm gonna use it for. Well, I tell you, one person she doesn't want you to. Be. <laughs> we'll talk about that. Um, anyway, so we are talking about 1981's uh, Excalibur by John Borman. John Borman's a character. Oh, John Borman. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Yeah, so Excalibur. I, I I have to kind of maybe admit that I don't remember seeing this whole thing straight through. It feels like a shame hole for me that I don't know that I've actually seen this movie. <laughs> it's one of those ones where I th- I'm pretty sure I've seen, and I and and I have such an awareness of the of the legend, obviously, that it feels like I've seen it, but I'm not totally certain that I had. I have seen this movie a bunch. Yeah. A whole bunch, and and I know there's some things that you have questions about. Yes, I know you have. You, you there was some stuff you're saving for the episode. Yes, and I don't know. Maybe I can. Maybe I can answer. Yes, that. I don't know. Um, so uh, so this movie came out in 1981. I probably saw it on VHS or when it premiered on HBO in '82. Yeah, um, I, I feel like I caught bits and pieces of it on like cable television or something. Yeah, yeah. Now. It's really, really important to to note the dates there. Yeah. Because, you know, like it came out in 81. It was on VHS and cable in 82, 83. I was born in 77. I saw an R-rated movie (laughs) at the age of like five or six (laughs) with no problem. You know, I mean, like I saw this movie a lot as a a lot as a kid. Um, There's a lot of rape in this movie. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, both male and female. Uh huh. Yep. Uh, it's 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 a movie that, that the door lot swings of, both ways. There's a lot of equal opportunity rape in this. <laughs> yes. Well, equal opportunity, lots of things. Yeah. <laughs> like even the women are like fighting and stuff. Yeah. You know, like when when there's like sieges going on, it's like Guinevere is like you know in the mix. That's She's true. In the mix. Yeah. Um. Anyway, I, real quick though, I want to back up here uh, and talk about like why i like picked this movie or why i was like you know wanted to talk about this movie or whatever um so the next three episodes this one and the next two are i'm kind of i'm kind of classifying it as a little bit of a uh, of a mini um theme if you will um we've got in these next three episodes we've got this movie and the one uh, week after next from the 80s, right around the same time, 81. And we've got a movie from the 90s. And they're, they're three very different movies. But there are also three movies that could probably never be made in this day and age anymore. Yeah. Um, All right. And for three different reasons. Um, this movie, Excalibur... And we'll and when we get to the other two movies later, we'll we'll talk about why I don't feel like they could be made in this day and age. Uh, but I think you already know where I'm going with this. But with Excalibur, um, th- this is a movie that used to be made a bunch. Um, up until about. 15, 20 years ago or so. Maybe about 15 years ago. Well, this sort of fits into that sort of sword and sorcery type It is a sword and sorcery. It's, it's definitely a fantasy movie. Yeah. Uh, every Everything about this movie and the way that it's shot, the way that it's, you know, the sequences work, the the, the leg, it's, a, it's based on a legend. Mm-hmm. So this is all very much a, a, a fantasy film. Um, and, you know, this is a relatively big budget movie. I mean... It has to be with with you know, having to set a period piece with a bunch of knights and armor and horses and battles and uh, you know uh, there's sweeping scenes of battles where there's stuff going on in every piece of the of the frame. Yeah, but but interestingly too, it's all t- it's all shot very tight. Um, the battle scenes are. Yeah. So it, it, they're they're definitely getting the most bang for their buck. Sure. It's but, it's uh, not like a um. 
it's not like huge epic battle scenes like no. a, like a Braveheart or something oh, like no, that. No, I, I guess what I'm saying is, is like there are a couple of of siege moments yeah. early in the film where there's a there's a establishing shot where they're like riding up to the siege. Sure, order. and and there is some choreography going on as a whole. Um, and you know, I mean, there's got to be a ton of stunts. There are people falling off walls. There's people getting hit with with swords and shit in their armor and you know there's there's a lot of staged uh uh, uh stunt choreography i sure. guess yeah um but this is a type of movie that if it's made today it's laughed out of theaters almost immediately the fantasy genre has kind of died um for there to be the birth of like the superhero genre Superhero genre, I believe, has kind of taken over fantasy. Well, I think um, the fantasy genre kind of hit its apex with the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, after that, it was kind of like, well, fuck. Well, and also, what's there left to do? The funny thing is, also though, is that Lord of the Rings is is so popular that like almost anything that has any kind of approximation to sorcery or a journey or a hero's journey is oftentimes labeled as a ripoff of Lord of the Rings or something when like there are things in this movie made almost 40 years ago and certainly 20 years before the first Lord of the Rings that that mirrors a lot of that Lord of the Rings story you know like a fellowship uh you know, the idea of seeking something, searching for something to defeat an ultimate evil and so on and so forth. So it's, uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's a, um, yeah, I, but it's, it's just, it's a genre that doesn't re- like even in the midst of Lord of the Rings. I mean, there was like the Dungeons and Dragons movie that was a flop. Yeah. There was, um, movies like Dragonheart that's, Either some some people really love that movie, and some people think it's a goofy. That, that movie's movie. okay. Um, what was Rain of Fire? That's a bad movie. I like that movie. That's a bad movie, man. It might be a bad movie, but I like that movie. <laughs> I, but it's you, know, you see what I'm saying. It's like it, there's nothing that that captures the spirit of these types of movies anymore. And certainly, it's hard to uh, it's hard to have like even recently there's been Robin Hood movies. I feel, and, I feel and, like they try to make a new Robin Hood movie every other year now, and they're just bad. Right. It's like there's no way you can really upgrade that story. Like, Did, like, didn't really Scott try and make a Robin Hood movie with Russell Crowe? Yes. A few years back, and that was bad. Yeah. yeah. I mean, like, basically, aside from Disney and Kevin Costner, you're done. You know, like after that, what what more do you? I mean, and, and probably like the old Errol Flynn type stuff, you know, or right. or whatever, like the old, the old style. Um, but like knights and well, they've almost kind of gone the way of the biblical epic, you know? Yeah, kind of. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like there's just not many movies where you see there being a stress on knights and kings and mm-hmm. kingdoms and chivalry and mm-hmm. you know and that sort of stuff it's it's been replaced by maybe more um realistic or cynical type stuff yeah um yeah you know it's like we're we're not watching battles from the dark ages anymore we're watching movies about guys coming home from you know the middle east all fucked up you know yeah. it's like yeah, yeah. yeah it's cynical it, it's or maybe that's not the right word but you you know what i'm saying i think yes and i think you're right about the the comic book movie specifically the marvel universe sort of taking its place in our yeah in, in its cinema and the cinematic history it's it, yeah it's 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 surplanted the sword and sorcery the the well, the fantasy epic yeah because also like fantasy epics also tended to have uh almost superheroic type of people mm-hmm. in it um I mean, like King Arthur is probably a very early example of a superhero, uh, a mythological superhero. Mm-hmm. Um, although I'm sure you could say, you know, well, technically the Hercules and all those older Greek mythology type characters. But yeah, I, I, I for some reason, I don't know why it just now popped in my head and not the whole time we were watching Excalibur. But um, we were as we were watching this movie, we were talking about our favorite versions of this story. 
and um, I have another one to add to it. So when we talk about that list, I have, I have yeah. another one to add to it because the song is all stuck in my head. Okay. Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right. So. King Arthur and Robin Hood. <laughs> Home movies. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, but that's, I mean. Yeah. I know. Okay. It's just funny. All right. Gotcha. It's, all right. It's well, all stuck in my head now. <laughs> Thank you, Brendan Small. Yeah. So, um, all right. So, Excalibur. Um, I I think it's, uh, like, before we really talk about the movie, I want to talk about John Borman a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, John Borman... Um, this is his fourth pretty big time movie in a row. And I don't know too much about him as a director or his career before the first movie I'm going to mention here. Um, but he had an interesting seventies that led to this <laughs> 1981 movie. Uh, so he really rose to prominence with, well, I'm sure there's other movies that, led up to this but um deliverance is a huge oh, yeah. huge movie it's got i mean it's burt reynolds doing like you know crazy uh almost exploitation type of you know lost in the woods type of but movie. It, but also critically sure regarded. i mean it was it was nominated for best picture right yes yeah um yes that and was he nominated was nominated for best director he was yeah. nominated for producing and directing yeah. so best picture best director um, then two years after that, <laughs> he did, this is one hell of a follow up to deliverance. Yeah, he did Zardoz, <laughs> um, which, you know, is kind of a, um, y y y I mean, <laughs> I feel like someday we should probably talk about Zardoz. I would like to watch Zardoz. Yeah. That would be fun. Yeah. That's a, that's a weird movie. Ain't it? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> That's an understatement, I know, but holy moly. Yeah. Um, so, okay, so then he did, so he did Zardoz. Um, oh, fuck. And that's a movie that is, it really, it really, really shoots for the moon. Oh, yeah. And maybe in some ways doesn't come close, doesn't leave the atmosphere, and in some ways, it goes all the way to Jupiter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, like, it didn't just shoot for the moon. It, like, landed on Jupiter. Uh, it's kind of fun. I mean. Uh, it's a, man, it's it's something else. Yeah. Um, but then. Oh, God. If, if Zardoz wasn't enough to How get did him. How survive these two I movies? don't know. Then he did Exorcist 2. Oh, my God. Which is another movie that seems like, in some ways, it's trying to reach for the stars. Yes. And it lands on the moon in this case. Yeah. Cuz it's it's it is definitely one that it's like he's trying to say something I think about psy the psychology of religion maybe. I, th I think it shoots for the stars but it's it's a challenger explosion. <laughs> I mean it, it's ter it's terrible. It is. It's bad. <laughs> it's bad. It's bad but it's Actually even even saying it explodes going in, into orbit is is probably is probably too, too interesting <laughs> a an outcome for exorcist 2 what's the uh, what's the footage of the of the uh, of the rocket that starts and then it, it like it doesn't even leave the ground it just <laughs> yeah, crumbles right yeah yeah right it's it, it can it barely gets off the ground and then it just crumbles you're yeah right. it well what's funny about that movie is is that he's he's offered the direct a sequel to a movie he didn't like right that he actually despised he hated the first exorcist um so what are you doing what are yeah. you uh, that one's not so much on him i wonder if it was a I wonder what the politics there were like maybe, <laughs> maybe they know. needed a director and he was like sure like favor for a favor kind of thing there's got to be a story i there. don't know i i don't know but we're not talking about exorcist too maybe one day we will man i don't know but it's, um that's hard to watch <laughs> <laughs> but it's also kind of fascinating yeah, to I watch totally agree um, james Earl jones in that is is <laughs> what the fuck <laughs> <laughs> and linda blair is very pretty in that movie yes I was always, I, I'm wrong when I've when I've chastised you in the past for liking her in that. She's gorgeous. She's of age. She's of age yeah. In that. Yeah. But she, her character is. Her, her character is. But she is. Yes. She's gorgeous in it. 
Like rain, I, I'm radiant. sorry for Chess. Yes, for you should be. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, so then he does Excalibur, which is another movie that is very large scope. It's it's a very it's a very um, it's almost um, what, what's the word I'm looking Wait, for? What did you just say? He did what? Well, after Exodus Two, he did Excalibur. He did, he did Excalibur, right? Yeah, okay. and and it's 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 a little pretentious. Um, oh, it's very pretentious. But this time it works. Where the last two movies didn't. You know, it's like th- this works on the pretension that 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 Deliverance kind of worked on, mm-hmm. I think. Um, and it, <laughs> after this, he does later in the eighties make. Um, Hope and Glory, which he gets nominated for three Oscars for. Yeah, and that's so, kind of, it was kind of like his last sort of respected movie, in a way. Yeah, what else has he done since? I, I looked and, gl- and, I, and I noticed a couple things. His 90s were pretty bad. Um, I feel like he did... Um, I feel like he did something else that I'm not seeing here listed. Um but nothing great. I mean, no. where the heart is that movie with Natalie Portman? I think was it. Is that, that where one? she gave birth? Oh, that's a Walmart? different one. No. Oh, <laughs> no, it's a totally different movie. It's got Uma Thurman, Crispin Glover. I bet that's interesting. Huh. I've never heard of this. Huh? Boy, Christopher Plummer, hmm. Crispin Glover, and John Borman in the same room. Yeah, that's right. weird. Um, um, he did the Taylor of Pan- Panama. Oh, that's the one I was thinking. Yeah. Okay. That was a pretty good movie. Yeah. So, anyway, I mean, the guy made his career in the span of about 15 years, from Deliverance to Hope and Glory. Mm -hmm. And there's some stuff in between that's a little weird. (laughs) That's very weird. Uh, But you can't say that he doesn't have some sort of sense of a grand idea. He can tackle a grand idea. Whether or not it can land, I don't know. But he he's not afraid to try some things, mm-hmm. and that's uh, appreciative. Um, but um, so with Excalibur, I'd kind of mentioned you know it's like this movie's kind of part of my youth. Um, I judge every King Arthur movie on the Excalibur scale. Yeah, uh, totally. I mean, w- now we can talk about the the yeah, scale here. The scale. So. After seeing it, I would probably agree um, with that assessment. I I grew up on Sword and Stone. Sure. That, I mean, that's a Disney movie, that's, and that's fair. And then also in high school, we read one of the one of the the, the I don't know what, I can't remember who wrote them, but a pretty well respected um, series of texts about King Arthur and his knights. Not not. Quite, not Mallory's. No, no, yeah. not quite. You know that old. Um, I think they were maybe 18th or 19th century. Okay. Um, and they were they were, they were really good, and that was kind of where I got a lot of the rest of the mythology. Okay. Um, so I, I you know, I, I and, and Camelot. I, I grew up with that. My mom loved that movie. Um, so I did grow up with with that movie, which I like quite a bit. Um, but this is almost like well, it's John Borman's. King Arthur. It's like this is the movie that Mel Gibson would direct, right? Right, right. I yeah. mean, it is, it is violent. Yeah, it is kind of unflinching. Yeah, in that regard, like, like there's no problem saying. I mean, like right out of the gate, there's a Chiron that comes out. It's like the Dark Ages. Yeah, you know, it's like this is meant to be a life sucks, things suck, people are basically dogs mm-hmm. you know i mean like it, it, they, they have no problem saying that people are which kind of uh, i'll get to a little bit more when we talk about like what i would call the quote-unquote politics of this movie which isn't politics but it's the politics of the uh the message that it's trying to send without it being political well, if that it, makes sense, i'll make I'll, yeah, I'll clear that up th- this movie um aesthetically feels correct mm-hmm. like it, it is it is I mean, there's what a lot I would imagine of, this world to look like and feel like and be. There is certainly a like when I read Ivanhoe, this is the type of world I had in mind, right? Yeah, this <clears throat> is there's certainly a um, a care put into this world. Like it's 
it is um like like they they want this to look real and to feel mm-hmm. lived in when well, you, thing, the, the dirt and the mud yeah. and the the there's nothing there's clean. grime there's it's a grime, grime. and the even, only thing even the way it's it. shot is is hazy yeah and, yeah I mean, the, the only thing clean in it are the two actresses yeah Helen Mirren and um uh uh Sri Lungi mm-hmm. um I've got a story about her too um th- I mean this movie is a um this is a cornerstone of my like the movies I grew up with, the movies I would watch as much as I possibly could. Um, and despite nudity and violence and no swearing, uh, but nudity and violence, nudity and violence, the stuff that most parents would be uh, more careful about than than language, I would say, probably in our generation. Uh, I had you know, free reign to see it. I mean, it wasn't like I was going out in the suit of armor and, you know, I wasn't <laughs> I, I wasn't influenced to go out in the suit of armor and mace some motherfuckers. You know, um, although I would have um, <laughs> if I had that suit of armor and mace. Um, I did try to build an Excalibur out of Legos. That doesn't work. Oh, yeah, it's gonna crumble instantly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's no Lady of the Lake to fix it. No, <laughs> <laughs> no, you're fixing it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it's in like a billion pieces. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, no, this is. Um, I I think most people would agree this is a pretty good movie. Yeah, uh, it's it's good. Um, it's confounding though. Okay. It it it, <laughs> it confuses me in its in its in its approach to the story because there's a lot of the metaphor is explained to you outright in the dialogue right so it's 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 hitting you over the head with a lot of things like there's one moment you know there's one scene where Lancelot it's sort of his um his uh ta- not Tatooine a Dagobah cave scene right oh yeah where he's here he's, he's wrestling he, with he's, himself. he's naked and he's wrestling the night right and it's himself and yeah it's like i get it and then he specifically says i've been fighting myself it's like we fucking get it yeah. <laughs> there's a lot of that in this movie especially in the first two acts yeah but then it sort of drops all of that and goes heavy into the um the metaphorical imagery and 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 and, and, yeah. and the pretension and kind of drops the explanation which which but then it also feels flimsy and doesn't quite connect at that point either. So, okay. So yeah. So there's just, there's, I, I think it could use, the script could be stronger. Well, in some ways, I kind of almost look at it like some of that subtext turning into text type stuff. Yeah. I almost see that as this is almost written as if it's a Shakespearean uh-huh. adaptation. Well, yes, absolutely. So, because Shakespeare would be really, really like, like Juliet, you know, or Romeo takes the poison, and then he says, "I've taken the poison" or whatever. Right, you right, know? Yeah, and it's yeah. like, yeah, we get it, you know. Yeah. But but that's just I mean that was the style of that was an older style of I don't know. In a way, I I think it almost plays better with the. It's very theatrical. It is. It's theatrical, but also in some ways feels, I don't know, maybe realistic. Like, well, because at that talked... point he's 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 pleading to the gods, to the muses, basically at this point that he's fighting with himself. It's it's very, um, I don't know. It's just a very old style of well, writing. Well, there there are moments where I do feel it works, and it is an older style of writing. It's it is they're very theatrical, very Shakespearean the way the way it was approached. But it but it was also an even. I guess was my point. Like like stick, oh, stick yeah. with it, right? Don't drop it. Um, because then you get to the stuff with um, Percival and the and the Covenant. No, yeah, not the Covenant. They are uh, the um Grail, yeah, right? The Grail, and it gets super abstract. Yeah, like John Borman's like, whoa, wait, motherfucker. This yeah. Is my, this is my movie. <laughs> yeah. Step aside, William Shakespeare. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but we did talk about um scenes of realism and things that I was impressed with was when um uh when Arthur pulls the sword from the stone. Oh yeah. How just sort of comical that was. Yeah. He's like 
and how clueless Arthur is about everything. He's kind of a dork. Yeah. Right. He goes. He he's lost his um his father's sword. He's a squire to his his no his brother his brother. He's squire yeah. to his brother. Right. Who is not really his brother, and his father's not really his brother. He's like you said. He's kind of like Uncle Owen. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um. But he magic uh, man shows up here. Yeah. Take care of this baby. But yeah. he um he loses <laughs> his brother's sword, so he's got to go find a new one. He's chasing somebody who stole it. A little which, kid, like a little which minstrel kid, was or very something. bizarre. Yeah. yeah. It almost feels like it was. It should have been like the lady in the lake or someone who stole it, right? Because to get him to go pull the sword, maybe but, I don't but know. She can't leave but she lake. can't leave the lake, right? <laughs> but anyway, it felt it felt kind of like just funny because he goes up to the sword and there's no pretense. There's no like like soaring music, right? Right? There's no like. There's a little shining bit shining light behind. There's a him. little bit of a Kubrickian hum. Yeah. In the background. Yeah, just a little it. bit of ambient noise. Yeah. But he pulls the sword out and it's kind of like, huh, I got a sword. Yeah, and then his his brother comes. He's like, "Somebody stole your sword, but here's Excalibur." <laughs> 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 and then his brother, which I love, could have taken credit. Yeah, because the dad comes up. And is like, "Kay, did you pull that?" Yeah, he's like, "I did." Well, no, no, I didn't. Arthur, did. Arthur did, and I love that because yeah. there's there, that's part of what I was going to say about like the politics of the movie. What the movie is trying to spin for you in a in a political sort of. Not, again, I'm using politics, but it's not. It's the politics of the f- structure that this movie builds, not yeah. the politics of politics. You know, whatever. But like the idea that 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 men can be good, mm-hmm. but they're fatally flawed in every way. Yeah. Um, but but to, uh, let me, right, right, right. Let me right, put, yeah, put a bow. Yeah, let me yeah. put a bow no, on no, the absolutely, seat absolutely. because because he's he's so awkward about it. And then he's like, well, I'm just going to put it back. Yeah, he, he puts, puts it back, back. <laughs> and then everybody's like, "Well, try and pull it again." <laughs> yeah, and then what's his name? Uh, Patrick, not Patrick Stewart. Somebody else comes. Yeah. he's like, "Well, I'm going to get it now." So it's almost like in his head, he's like, "Well, he loosened it up, you know. Yeah. I'm going to get it now," and he and he can't. Uh, and then the monk who's there is like starts to try and like spray the sage on him, right on on Arthur again because he's got to be part of this this process, and it's like this confusion. Yeah, and 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 but also tempered confusion. Because right. you'd think there'd be a lot more excitement and buzz, and it's building, but it's not quite, it's not cinematic at all. Right. Which is hilarious. Yeah. And then he pulls it again. This time, just one-handed. Just one-handed. He raises, yeah, it, raises it, up. it up. Yeah. But he still doesn't know what to do with he it. Doesn't, he, doesn't, he doesn't comprehend what it means. Right. And everybody then starts fighting, <laughs> and then he just fucking runs off into the forest. <laughs> Well, to be fair, it's so good. Like to that be fair, he runs off after because Merlin comes up and explains, right? Like, you are, you know, you are king. You know, it's like right. this was me- you, this was your destiny, and then Merlin just walks off. Yeah, and like you know, Arthur is like he can't get answers from the from the fighting crowd because like even his adopted dad and step and brother. <laughs> Basically, like he pulled the sword, and they're like they're going off to fight, you know. <laughs> and and like so, you know, Arthur's looking at the fight, looking back at Merlin, who's like walking off way off into the distance. Now. So he's just like, I'm off, I'm out of here. And so he starts chasing after Merlin. <laughs> but yeah, but it's like his first instinct is I gotta run away, right? Um, but that leads to um, a few minutes later, a really really important scene because they go uh, Patrick Stewart who plays Guinevere's father is the first person to stand up for him. Mm-hmm. And it's like, he, he pulled the sword. I don't care if it's a boy or a man. Right. I'm, I'm following. I don't like, I kind of feel like these were the rules we put in place. This was the rule. Yeah. You, whoever draws the sword, be it is the king. boy, man, woman, girl, it's the, you know, is the leader. Right. And then, uh, so he's like, he's besieged by all the people who refuse to follow some boy squire. So the main guy that uh, that that was like opposing all of it was also the guy that was like trying to pull it after he thought he loosened it up. Yeah. yeah. Well, he was also the champion of the of one of the heats, one of the jousting heats. Yeah. Yeah. You know. So yeah, he you know, fair enough, I guess. But anyway, but he had um, a lot of people behind him too. Well, yeah, because yeah. he was like he was like big man on campus. Yeah. You know. So. Um, he uh so like basically uh Arthur gets him basically to the point where it's like I'll show you mercy if you swear by my lead because over the course of like 12 hours or so Arthur gets a little bit of advice from Merlin figures out a problem on his own yeah 
And and Merlin tells us to be impressed by that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But he, uh, you know, so like he's gathered people to go help Patrick Stewart. By the way, Patrick Stewart's in this fucking movie. Isn't yes, that great? He's great in it too. Yeah. Um, so he, uh, <laughs> so like, you know, he's got the guy at the, at the tip of Excalibur. It's like, basically I'm going to kill you if you don't, you know, it's like, if you don't call an end to this and he's like, I'm not going to kneel to a squire. Right. And he's like, Oh wait, yeah, you're right. I'm not a knight. So how can you follow the lead of, of a King who can't be a knight? Yeah. So he hands over Excalibur to the guy and it's like, it's up to you to knight me. And the guy's like thinking about it, and it's like he some could people, take the sword, he could kill Arthur, and a lot of people would follow him. Right? Yeah, because he's got people in the he's got he's got his uh, number two dude in the back. So just like, don't take it. the sword. Yeah. yeah, just take it. Yeah, you know, in this. Yeah, but you know, he's overcome with the goodness mm -hmm. that uh, seems to kind of follow to a certain extent Excalibur mm -hmm. uh, for the most part. But also the the. The gesture. The gesture. The, the gesture is a, an extremely heroic and mm -hmm. extremely mature mm -hmm. he kneels. He kneels before him and says, knight me. Yeah. Knowing full well he could be beheaded. Yeah. 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 And, uh, you know, at that point, that guy is like, yeah, you are a king. And it impressed <laughs> the hell out of Merlin, too. Because <laughs> yeah. he's like, I didn't see this coming. Yeah. <laughs> Basically, that those exact words. Yeah. 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 <laughs> he, he is most definitely the chorus. If we talk about this being written most, in an old school. Most certainly the chorus. And and honestly, my favorite part of the movie is Merlin. Yeah. Um, because it, Nicole Williamson, who plays him, is very over the top. Yeah. And the way he changes his inflections. And yes. Things, oh, he's so great. I, yeah. And he is eating it up. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But I think he is truly the only character in this movie, even, even more so than Morgana. That is, that doesn't fit in this world. Yeah. Which leads to a piece later where he's like, you know, I've got to go. This is not the world of, you know, this is the world of men now. Not, right. You know, my time is his past. Um, so, like, this isn't that much of a fantasy movie. It's only really just mostly Merlin and a little bit of Morgana. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, but uh, yeah. So uh, another another actor in this uh, at the very beginning is Gabriel Byrne. Yes, and he plays Uther Pendragon, which is Arthur's Arthur's father. father. And uh, he is given he's a real, Excalibur. He's a real piece of shit. Yes, but he's granted Excalibur through strength yeah. through through his his strength, but. Basically, he's granted the sword to be tested his soul, basically. Yeah, and he fails. And he fails instantly. Yeah. Instantly. Yeah. So he's he's pulled the sword, and he's like, hey, one king, one land, or one land, one king. I'm the guy. Um, but you have all this land. Well, the other guy's like, well, what, okay, I'll give you that, but what are you going to give me? Right. And, and like, Merlin's kind of elbowing Uther. It's like, he's giving you something. What are you going to give him back? Right. That's something that's part of being a leader. Right. Mer Merlin is, is a pretty good counselor. Yes. Through this movie. Right. Yeah. Um, because ultimately, you know, I mean, being a wizard, you would think of him being in touch with the land and with mm -hmm. the, the whole point of Excalibur was to be granted to a king that can unite the land, that can prosper. What I like from about... That merlin in this too is that while he gives good counsel he's also an instrument mm -hmm. of the wielder of excalibur so he does not deny um uther's wishes yes even so, though he knows that it is not the right thing to do well in a way he's a little bit of a futurist well, there, yes. there are some things that he does that I think he does it because he knows what he's what's right. to come from it. Right. I, I would agree with that as well, because he he's like, our, it's almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy. Yeah. Yeah. So he so so the guy is like, OK, what are you going to give me? And and uh, Gabriel Burns like uh, the lands from here into the sea are yours. Basically saying Wales is yours, I think, is what that was probably. Cool. I'll take Wales. Yeah, sure. <laughs> and the guy's like, cool, I'll take Wales. <laughs> And so uh, he's like, let's feast tonight. Yes. So they go party to the feast. Time. They party. 
and uh, and he's like, uh, Egraine, my wife will dance for us. This this is interesting to me because number one, she's smoking hot, <laughs> and you were really you really were impressed with her. And I was very impressed with her and her dancing, and <laughs> it's very spinny, very uh, yes. very spinny, and her bare chest. Well, that was later. Yes, but she. This I think was almost a setup because I think that the guy who got whales. I'm her, assuming her husband, whales, yeah. her husband. Yeah, we're just going to say it's whales. It's Duke her, Wales. Her, Duke Wales. Names. We're going to say the Duke <laughs> Wales. I think he kind of did this because he it was an uneasy alliance and he was testing Uther as well. Uh, maybe. I don't know. I mean, maybe. But it's a weird scene because because Gabriel Burns straight up tells his second in command. He's like, I, I must, I must have, have her. her. Yeah. Right. And then he's, the other guy's like, you're insane. And he's, <laughs> yeah, he is. Yeah, he's openly lusting for her. And, and um, Duke, Ar- Duke Wales over there <laughs> sees it and he's almost expecting it. And then it's on. And then it's like battle. Yeah. So like w- it took literally three hours to fuck up England. Yeah. They didn't even finish a meal. No. <laughs> No, it's like that's about how long it took to vote on Brexit. It's about how long it took for Uther Pendragon. Nobody to fuck knew up. what they were voting for. <laughs> um, so anyway, um, so you know, then Uther's like, um, I want you to 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 you do the spell the spell of making spell of making so that I can have one night with the grain like. Yeah. He is willing to just throw, like, take England, wad it up, and throw it into the Atlantic. Like a used condom. <laughs> to use a condom for one night. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but he didn't use a condom. Oh, God, no. No. No, he didn't even take off his fucking suit of armor, practically. I know. It's like he was that fucking was... her with, like, the metal spikes on his on his armor. It was weird. It's like, dude, at least take your... How did you get your dick out? <laughs> I, I don't really don't understand how the, the physicality of that scene, how that worked. I think he took off his, his metal shiny pants. Okay. And then maybe, he had the maybe. top half all on. Maybe. But anyway, so the, the I spell I bet you Gabriel making... Byrne has a hairy ass. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> Probably. <laughs> He's Byrne Irish, like, right? No, we're not going to show that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Although, dude, he did Zardoz with That's Red true. Diaper Man. That's true. Red Diaper Man. Yeah. Anyway, so uh, the spell making basically uh, awakens the dragon. The dragon is basically the force. It's everything around you. Right. It's, it's, it's the force. It's the good and the bad. Uh-huh. So it's kind of like God and devil. And Excalibur is part of And Excalibur is part, part of, of it. We're all part of it. Right. Um, and so, like, uh, your lust will carry you across the, uh, the moat into the castle. You'll look like Duke Wales. Uh-huh. And uh, you, you'll get the lady. Yep. But as he's going across and going into the castle, Duke Wales dies in battle. And Morgana, his actual Duke Wales who, daughter. Who has a little bit of the sight. Yeah, she wakes up suddenly. He's like, my father's dead. Yeah. And she's like, and, and Egraine's like, oh, pff, no, it's fine. And, and, it's fine. And, yeah, and then she's, and she, and then and she's like, like, see, there he, there he is. is. And she's like, nope, that looks like Gabriel Byrne. Yeah, <laughs> but it's, yeah, so she, she, she sees she through. She sees through it. And uh, which is important later as she grows up to be Helen Mirren that she, you know, like she proves herself to Merlin that she has the sight. Uh Um, But anyway, uh, then they fuck. But in order for for the the spell to have been cast, uh, Gabriel Byrne was asked that whatever comes of this belongs to Merlin. He's like, sure, whatever. Fuck it. I don't care. It's one night, you know. Well, the baby came from that. Right. So Merlin comes in, takes the baby away, just takes him. Yep. And gone. And, you know, he's like, you told me I'll have what. And this was just the moment when Uther had learned to care about something. His lust fucked that up. Yeah. So that's part of that politics again, right? Of the movie, of this, mo- that, yeah. that, that, you know, yeah, it's great that he can care for something now because all he had known was butchering before. But. You made a deal when you were a butcher and when you were prideful and lustful and everything. You yep. reap what you sow, man. Yep, yep. And uh, humans are flawed, you know. And and uh, yes, while this is the ultimate king of England, uh, he's got to go through some bad times first with no king and, and nothing. You know, Back to the Dark Ages. Pretty much. Yeah. Uh, which also plays out again later in the movie. Uh, with 
Mordred being uh-huh. uh, the the inbred son of Arthur and Morgana. Yeah, which is where it starts to get a little murky for me. Yeah, let's talk about the, the murkiness of it. <sighs> so I always feel like the Grail is shoehorned into the King Arthur story. Well, I think it's a way for England to feel self-important. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I don't, that, I, I'm, I'm dunking on England here. I'm sorry. And it will, <laughs> Yeah, and it's it's like a, I guess it's a way to romanticize the Crusades in some way. A little bit, yeah. Uh, I, I would say that this probably was sanitize written. Sanitize the Crusades? Yeah. yeah. I would say this, the, the, this insertion of the Grail probably comes at a time to, to make people feel better about. Right. Well, pff. I don't think there was any making few people, but to justify your yeah. your actions, yeah. Um, but 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 it doesn't. It's never really quite clear Arthur's tie to the land, why he needs the Grail, why he's getting sick, yeah. Um, so why the Grail will heal him, and it's weird too because the 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 answer to the riddle that Percival must answer is who the Grail serves, and the Grail serves Arthur, and Arthur's part of the land. It's like what. Like why? Why would the Grail serve Arthur? Yeah. So uh, and the Grail isn't really explicitly explained, even though it's pretty well known to be the the chalice that Jesus drank drank from at the Last Supper. Yeah. So it there, just gets really murky and abstract. There, there are points in this in which <laughs> the the mysticism of Merlin and the relig in the in the Christian religion mm-hmm. kind of start to cross paths mm-hmm. because. Part of that is why Merlin fades. Yeah. And and what what comes from that is the age of men, which is essentially, I would say, probably ties to the sacrifice of Christ. Sure. So, you know, so that's like Merlin states a few times that his power is waning Mm -hmm. as the time as the movie progresses. So, you know, the the longer that 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 western religion is is around the more the mysticism part is starting to fade i guess i guess yeah so um and it also i get somewhat to the to the idea that okay so like the idea that arthur is almost like a um almost like a a a, a pharaoh like a like a a theological uh, a leader like a a a, a, a uh, well he's a, he's a, 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 a deity almost well yeah the, i was i was gonna say he's 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 like jesus he's yeah he's like the christ figure in this movie yeah um and his i don't know but not really either because well he's kind of given that look too like yeah. even when he marries because he, he marries a but woman who's unfaithful but he to doesn't him. really sacrifice ever himself he just starts to well, get sick. He does sacrifice himself when he's healthy again. He he goes to fight Mordred knowing that this was the end. Right. Well, sure. Yeah. Um that yeah. that he fights for cuz he tells Guinevere um which we'll we'll have to real quick. Of course Guinevere and Lancelot sleep together, get discovered by Arthur. Lancelot runs away and next time you see him he's a crazy like long-haired weirdo. <laughs> yes, he is. And the next time you see her, she's a nun. She's a, she's she's been sent to the nunnery. Yeah, get um, thee to a nunnery. <laughs> <laughs> um, so like he tells her when he goes on his last ride, basically he stops by the old nunnery, checks in. It's like, hey, how's it going? You know, and he basically tells her that he fights for one for what was for what once was, and what will be again. Um, meaning that he knows he's. This is it. This is the, you know, this is my last fight. Yeah. Uh, but that my vanquishing of evil will allow the the land to continue, basically, I think is the point of that. Also, he says to her that, you know, he has a dream that she will come to him, not as, you know, his queen, but as his wife and so on and so forth. And I think that's part of the three maiden thing when he's carried off. Yeah. I think she's one of them. Could be. Because he says it's just a dream and as he dies, I think he's taken away by her. But it's like and, okay, okay, okay. So but what's the point? What's the point of of this story? The point is is that 
what 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 does the world get out of all of this? This this fifty years of of it's a little bit of a lesson. There's some peace bookended by a ton of violence. Yeah. And then what what is the result for the world after after Arthur dies? Like what what good came I, of it? Well, I think I think the lesson. I think the 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 because everybody's dead. Yeah, Percival is the only one. Percival who lives. And, and Guinevere. Guinevere are the only two who live. Um, <laughs> Percival, who who maybe Patrick Stewart out there somewhere. Well, I think also both of those who live have a religious experience too. Mm, yeah, uh, you know, Guinevere becomes a nun. Percival basically answers God right. to get the Grail. To right? get the Grail, yeah. So they're kind of blessed, and and they're maybe protected in that sense, maybe. Mm -hmm. But I think the idea, I think the the lesson that's learned here is is that. It's the old idea of of how men can't have all the power. Like there, there has to be a balance in, you know, in like because the thing is, is also like when does things start going wrong for Arthur? When he coldly says he has to be king first and can't defend her against the allegation that she's cheating on him. Right. Even though he's right, right that laws have to apply for everyone, but he can't defend her because he has to be her judge, and things start to tilt the well, other way, well, where, where his power is is tilting the, the, the emotional side of a things. Lot, a lot of that, too, and I, I wish this was played up more, a lot of that, too, is Morgana kind of pushing oh, people's she's, buttons she's the snake yeah she right, right she's the snake right yeah she's the snake in the garden and of that, Eve. and that symbolism is very very heavy there's this, snakes all over snakes in this, all over this movie. and yep. uh, there's, there's snakes out there this big <laughs> <laughs> no uh because avalon was meant to be a and camelot was meant to be eaten right sure. and yeah. and it's lust that tears it apart there's a scene uh, too that kind of sets that up um because yeah, you're right. I mean, wh where things really start to fall apart is when Arthur discovers um, Guinevere and Lancelot asleep, naked after they've just had sex, and he and he puts the sword Excalibur in between them into the stone and, and walks off. It's almost like he's given up. He's given up, yeah. which which then leads to the illness of the right, and he gets punished by God when. You know, when they talk about Morgana and her, you know, she's she's, you know, now Mordred's a lie and he's the evil. He's kind of the Antichrist. And, and he gets struck by lightning yeah. in church. In church. That's a bad sign. Yeah, that's not good. <laughs> it's not good. It's like, oh, dude, this is the goal. She's going down. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and but but it's all. Kind and he's of lost the will to live. And, and in a way, remember when Lancelot has to when he fights himself and he has to come back to fight for. Uh, for Guinevere's honor, basically, uh, he's injured to the point where he, where they say he's lost the will to live. Yeah, and he says, "Heal him at whatever cost." Right, right. So and it's, it's the other Merlin moment. Right, and and he has Guinevere cover his wound and then heals him, and so the cost of that was was his wife and his will to live. Mm -hmm. So basically, everything shifted to Lancelot. Yep. Uh, everything that was Arthur shifted to Lancelot at that point, and it was, you know, I mean, that was really the the tipping point where, yeah, there is no good to come from that, right? Because as I kind of mentioned, Merlin's a little bit of a Mephistopheles, mm -hmm. where you make a bargain with him, it is literally what you say. Well, it's <laughs> it kind of goes back to to the 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 Star Wars uh, comparison. It's it's a balance. Yeah, it's not that. Yeah, it's not that Merlin has any ill intention necessarily, but he's like, "Look, I will do this thing, but there's a there's, there's other a side to the coin. There's well, a cost. It's, it's yeah. the it's the it's the idea of of magic. Yeah, particularly, I believe it's. I could be wrong, and if there's any Wiccans out there, I'm sorry if I got this wrong, but I believe chaotic magic. There's a cost for everything that you do. Right. Every every action you in, inflict on something, you get, you have to pay the tax. Yeah, and so. If you want something done, Merlin does it because he is a subject of Excalibur and the wielder of Excalibur. Yeah. But it's there's gonna be a cost. So yeah. it's the balance you're right. It's it's a balance and it's sort of like that, um is it a Twilight Zone episode, the box, right? Where they if they push the button, they get untold riches, but somebody somebody in the world that they don't know dies. Oh yeah. Right? Like yeah. it's it's that concept of, of balance and 
to get something you have to there's a price to be paid mm-hmm. is you know it's yeah it's everywhere yeah and and well it's uh you you just returned um an issue of dylan dog yeah. that i loaned you yeah. and there's a story like the chest yeah. of death yeah. where you know you can regain your life but you gotta lose you got so you've got to kill somebody you know right yeah. so you know it's like it's a personal cost yeah and I think ultimately that's what I'm saying is kind of the point of everything, yeah, right? Yeah. Is that when things tip one way, the reaction is going to, I guess, be pretty bad. I guess. Um, I, I guess in that sense, it too, it is is classical storytelling where the consequences of what happened there aren't necessarily nobody in this world really learns anything. No, but but the but he but says, but it's a lesson for the the watcher, the audience. Well, remember again when King Arthur is saying goodbye to to Guinevere, he says that you know I can't remember the exact line, but he's basically saying that my you know that um, my story or whatever. Basically, he says my story is for the future right. to learn from, and it's it's the legend, right? It's the legend. Right. Yeah, he yeah. he understands that at this point. What everything he's done will be deciphered or be picked apart by some by the future audience, yeah. and so, right. um, and, and that's also part of the idea of part of the moral of the story is you leave a footprint, and people will learn from the things you've done right and the things you've done wrong, yeah, and you'll be judged based on what the balance is at the end of the you know at the end of your list of good and bad. Yep. What's the ledger? What's the ledger show? And yep. you know, and and for him, he had to. You know, he had to go off and kill his own son. Yeah. You know. To balance things. To balance things. Huh. Yeah. Well, interesting. Um, so a couple of other notes. Um, uh, Nicole Williamson and uh, and Helen Mirren, they were, they were being pursued for this movie. <laughs> and they really didn't like each other in real life. What? Yeah. What, uh, what was the reason? Do you know? I, they probably just know each other from acting, yeah. and, you know, whatever. Uh, but they begged for the other not to be cast. If they were going to be in the movie, they begged. You don't say that to John Borman because he's <laughs> like, no, you're both going to be in it because it's going to give your your scenes together extra edge. Yeah, right. And there is a biting competition between the two of those, between Morgana and, and Merlin throughout the whole movie. Yes. And I think that benefited from them not so liking probably, each other. Probably, yeah. Because even at one point he puts his arm around her and it feels so weird. <laughs> like, like he knows that she's the end of him in the story, but like also they hate each other in real life. <laughs> <laughs> um, one other thing that I wanted to uh, bring, Liam Neeson plays a huge part in this. Yes. Uh, he is basically the one who. Sir Gawain. Yeah. He is the one who basically levies the, the accusation that, that, Guinevere is unfaithful, which he isn't at that point that he said. But uh, Morgana knows she, that she she's, she's real perceptive. She's needling things, yeah. yeah. And she's uh, she's she's done enough to sow the seeds of doubt uh-huh. into everybody's mind, and that's it's you know. And, and I think w- not long before that, um, there's a great scene where they're around the the round table, and Arthur stands up. He's like, "What is the greatest quality in a knight?" And they start to kind of discuss it and, and, and mention qualities. And he asks Merlin, what is it? And he's like, and no, Merlin, no, no poems. Just tell us straight out. What's the greatest quality? And, and Merlin's not paying attention. Yeah, Ner- <laughs> Merlin is just kind of in his own world. But yeah. he's like, he's like huh, but what? Then, he kind of, then he kind of snaps too. And he stands up and he walks through the table and he, and he says, truth. If yeah. Of all things, is truth. And I love what he says. He says, when a man lies, he murders some part of the world. Yeah. That is super well, cool. Well, again, it's the balance. Right. You know, your lie affects something down the line. Right. And um, uh, yeah. and then that kind of feeds into the Arthur sense of honor at that point, and yeah. and is like, well, I have to uphold the truth. Yeah, yeah, we have to get to the truth of this my, matter. My greatest, uh, uh, my my greatest counsel just said, yeah, this is the most important thing. Yeah, I'm, I he's never led me wrong. He never did lead him wrong. No, um, there may have been things that 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 Merlin shouldn't have done, but he never led either Arthur or Uther the wrong way. Right. Um, you know, but anyway, he did withhold some information from Arthur. Cause like at one point, Arthur, like he first meets Guinevere and he's like, can you make her love me? 
And he's like, no, I did that once for somebody, yeah. and it took me nine months to recover. Just say why you won't do it. Yeah. Because, you know, like, but no, he has to be cryptic about that shit. Yes. But yes. anyway, um, speaking of Guinevere, <laughs> uh, Cherie or Sherry Lungi played uh, Guinevere. She is in the music video, the one of my favorite songs from the 80s. What? Level 42's There's Something About You. Oh, weird. She is the main object of affection in that video Huh. that gets haunted by the guy who's the lead singer of, of Level 42, like who like dresses as like this kind of clown like not a clown like not a not a clown like like a circus clown but like um i don't remember this video at all oh man we're gonna watch it all right it's good <laughs> it's good i love that song and it's such a cool I remember video the song i don't remember the video i'm trying to remember if she was also possibly in the updated video for whiter shade of pale but i don't think so i think that was somebody else it might have been another actress that I'm, <laughs> um Anyway, I know that um, Harry Dean Stanton was in that video for. Uh huh. But okay. Yeah. Anyway, um, I love this movie. This movie is. Uh, I mean, like, I can see where some shortcomings are. I but at the same time, I didn't see as many shortcomings as I was afraid I might see because it had been a few years since I've and seen it, this and movie. And honestly, how old is this movie now? Almost forty years. Almost old? Almost forty years. I old. mean, it holds up. Yeah. From a cinematic standpoint. From a cinematic standpoint, there is a point to this movie. Yeah. There is a um, kind of realistic angle that this movie takes. I mean, uh, there's violence. I mean, you know, they don't cut back on violence or on nudity or anything like that. I mean, and it, it's, and it's a movie that I, I made this comment. It's two and a half hours long almost, and it moves. Like, it yeah. moves through... I don't know, 60 years of history or more. It's got, it's got, it's yeah, it's got decades to cover. And, and it, it is very efficient in its storytelling. Yes. There's very few moments where you're, you find yourself bored. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so I, I assume that's a recommendation from you. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. There's a good HD version uh, streaming on like YouTube, and I'm assuming you can also it, get it that, through Prime and it, stuff. Yeah, that it looked pretty good. It looked great. Um, I have a 20 year old DVD. I opted at the last <laughs> second this morning to 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 uh, just buy the 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 digital yeah. instead. It, lo it looks it great. Good. Um, it looks good. Yeah. It. Yeah. Um. Next week. Yes. What are we watching next week? We so can't. We can't talk about it. Oh, it's the first rule. It's the first rule. Huh? Yeah. It's another one of those movies that can't be made today. And we'll talk about that for sure. Yeah. Next week. Yeah, it really. And there's it a couple really of reasons why. And I don't want to get too um deep into those reasons because that that's a that's a that's a fucking it's a wildfire just wait that's just a, that's a pile of gasoline waiting for a match. But it is. I mean it's it's true. I haven't seen this movie in a long time. I just saw it a couple months ago. And I'm very happy to get to see it again but i'm feeling it was after it was after i saw it at flicks a couple months ago i was like i, I think we should do this i have a feeling c that considering the political climate that we're in that this movie is going to probably be even more relevant yet unable to be told again yes that but also i i think it will be a harder watch because of what it might stir up. I don't know. Maybe. We'll see. We'll see. I, I did not have... I was in a nostalgic haze. And I was also a little tipsy. <laughs> and, and we won't talk about the graphic novel sequel because it's terrible. Really? Okay. It's well, there's a second sequel now. It's, anyway. They're making it, right? Into a movie? I, I don't know. I don't know. We'll talk about it tomorrow or next week. Yeah, we'll see. Um, so, uh, yeah. Um, I don't know. It's Fight Club. Oh, shit. I thought we were watching Dumbo. Yes. <laughs> In the political climate, that is. <laughs> that is another shitty Tim Burton movie. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, where can people hear stuff about us? Oh, my gosh. Home base is filmseizure.com. You can search all the social medias for Film Seizure. We're there. Most active on Facebook. Absolutely. But new episodes um, are up every Wednesday. 
Every Wednesday at uh, 9.30 a.m., you can go over to filmseizure.com. Indeed. Uh, Eastern time. Eastern for those time. people who may be elsewhere. Um, yeah, and then Mondays at 2.30 Eastern time in the afternoon, get get a heaping, helping load of monster talk. Monsters. Monster Mondays. M -m -m Monsters. Um, let's see here. Uh, the, we're in, we're, uh, we're pretty much getting ready to start Godzilla month now. So oh, nice. In, in preparation yes. for the big G's return. New trailer. Looks pretty good. Mm -hmm. it sure does. Yeah. Um, anyway. Um, yeah. And so, um, yeah. Uh, until next week when we uh, talk about the thing we're not supposed to talk about. <laughs> I am Jeff Arbuckle. I am Jason Oliver. And you have been listening to Film Seizure. <laughs>